Welcome back to Gig Harbor Paddling. Today we're doing a technique video on the erg. Today we're working on what makes a powerful stroke in the canoe. We really focus today on the body posture. So it's so important that as kids are rotating, returning, we're thinking about where our body is and what it's doing to propel the boat forward. I'm looking in the pole, the top arm. Is it staying tall, right? In my pole, if I pull and my arm goes drops, I can tell it's not a very powerful stroke. I'm looking at the exit. I'm seeing if we're exiting early enough I'm seeing if maybe we're pressing up at the exit, and at the exit we really lag down. So in his setup, sometimes his uh, top arm is bent, so that's his left arm. I think of any bend in the arm like that as kind of a leakage of power, right? If I'm dropping on the water with a bent top arm, that force is going to go into my elbow and my shoulder. But if I straighten that arm, suddenly I'm able to use all of my arm, but also all of my you know, back and my legs. Everything's connected, right? Straight arms mean I'm connected. Bent arms mean I'm not. I think he might be pulling back before he's fully buried just a little bit, but I don't mind it. So when we talk about that armpit to knee, I think Thomas could go even lower and get that armpit to knee. Good. So then we have this fall that happens from the set to the catch, where the catch actually has to catch you. Some of you treat the catch as like a little catch. But it should feel like in your setup you're falling over and the catch quite literally catches you and you have to press up from there. In the pull, I'm thinking mostly about the top arm, right? And I'm thinking about that of that opposite hip. So is that hip pulling back? Is it returning? Is the top arm staying tall? Is it staying straight? Something I like about Thomas' stroke is his top arm stays really tall. And generally it stays pretty straight. In his pull, you see that his top arm never dips below the shoulder. It always stays above. And when it's time for the, the top arm to go down, he just exits. All right, looking at his hip, Thomas has great rotation. Right, we see the knee pulling. I, the only thing I would say is when I'm thinking about efficient power, I think especially if this was a sprint, I would want to return to. This looks more like a, a thousand meter, so I'm okay with more knee drive. But when we start getting into more sprint territory, I think that front knee won't be able to, to straighten as much. Thomas, you wobble to the paddle side or to the opposite side? Opposite. You wobble opposite. So sometimes that can be from prying off the boat, like Thomas said. Sometimes that can be from just exiting and putting our chest too much to the opposite side. When I'm thinking of that exit, I think a lot of people think of it like Thomas thinks of it. I'm just like, Time to get out, right? And move on to the next thing. But the exit's just as an important phase of the stroke as the setup to catch in the pole. Maybe not as much as the setup. The setup's kind of a baby. But when you exit, right, I think of that as your last chance to, to, to get any farther. So when I remember I would be racing, you know that feeling of like someone's right there, and you can't look, but you know it. And every time you make like a little mistake, you have, to, you have to really catch up on the next trip, right? And you're always feeling that push. The exit to me was the most important part. because it's the last part of my stroke that I can get ahead, right? It's the last time for me to press up. It's the last time for me to really push my hip forward to get the boat moving, okay? So I want you to think of the exit as your last push before you get to glide again, okay? And it needs to have some oomph. A lot of you guys exit and you hit the water really hard, you pull really hard, and then you kind of just like let the paddle fly out, right? But as long as you're in the water, that's an, that's an intense moment. And so don't let that moment go just because it's like time to exit, right? That little, just little stroke can move the boat so much and is responsible for so much glide. The four phases of the stroke, set up, catch, pull, exit. Now for canoe, there's like a sneaky fifth and that's the recovery. Okay, the recovery is from the moment you exit the water to your setup. Okay, it's that part in the middle. All right, technically it's not like the, the water part, but it's just as important because it sets up everything else. So in your recovery, right, we're, we're, get, we're setting ourselves up for the setup. It's the setup for the setup, okay? 
And our recovery is really important because if we're recovering like a goblin, okay, there's no way that we can become an elegant gazelle in our setup. It's just not going to be realistic or efficient if we battle like that. What happens, Angus, is in your setup, you're starting your setup with your chest low. So I often think of like the Iron Man symbol, or like if you wear necklaces, like the wherever the pendant would be, right? Where is that facing, right? Your Iron Man chest, okay? Is it facing up or is it facing down? Right now in your recovery, you're very bent over, right? So my line for my chest will go straight to the ground, okay? But when I recover, I want to be making sure my chest comes up. So some people call that like rotating up, which is, is hard. I never liked that because when I was an athlete, I was like, coach, what do you mean? I can't rotate up. My hips don't go that way. And it's not like I want your hips to quite literally ascend to the heavens. I want you to, as you exit, think about bringing your chest and rotating your chest up rather than rotating your chest down. Because Angus demonstrates what happens when you don't do that is when you get into your setup, you stay really low and hunched over. So what happens is when you're paddling down, then you have your butt behind your shoulders, okay? And so your hips are actually paddling behind you. And you always want your hips to paddle under and in front of you. So go ahead now and Angus, try and switch to as you recover, getting your chest up. Better, straighten that top arm. Better. Do you guys see the difference just with that cue of feeling more upright? If we're looking at the A-frame in the setup, right, the line from the back knee to the top arm, there you go, it's much better. We talked about the biggest thing that'll impact the catch for Angus, which is just falling on the blade, right? Um, and to do that, we need to make sure our chest is tall so that we can lower it. <laughs> so get it nice and tall and then let the chest fall onto the blade. Good. Before we were struggling moving our hip at all, and now it is moving up forward and back a little bit, and it is connected with your stroke, but it just needs more, right? So as you get more comfortable in your stroke, um, I think that will really improve. And then our exit, I really just want you to think about setting your exit up for your recovery. So when you exit, making sure your chest is tall and you reach your chest up rather than reaching your chest down. Cool? Yep. That's the biggest takeaway. As Henry is reaching in his stroke, I want to see the whole logo on this side. So from Bob's perspective, right, Bob should be able to read everything that's written on your back. Right? And that's not done, hold on, that's not done by stretch, by your abs, like contorting to the side to show your, to show, right? When I say that, a lot of people, they go from rotating while being connected to then thinking, ah, I need to show my back. So then they reach like this to like try and show their back off, right? You keep the box intact. So the box is the shoulders to the hips. That stays as one box. But as we rotate, we are able to drop the shoulder down and keep the line between the hip and the shoulder intact. And that's how you see my back. Now I would consider that more of a catch thing, but that's okay, let's roll into the catch. There you go. <laughs> All right, we're catching the water. Our arm is staying straight. And now that we've let our chest kind of rise and fall, I like the power that we see here. I think this is a really powerful stroke. How do we keep it powerful? That would be in the pull and exit. So let's move to the pull. What a lot of you do is you try and J-stroke in a team boat. And I don't think you realize it. You've just included it here. But um, what I do see that Aaron pointed out is that Henry's hip likes to pop out of the boat a lot. So this happens in your C1 plenty, and it makes the boat wobble. But as we reach, a kind of cheat for if we don't want to rotate, what we do is we just pop the hip out, and then we, we're getting a little extra like free room. Unfortunately, when we pop the hip out, what does that do to the stroke? The body weight isn't on the blade, right? So you're not connected, and so I'd say there's two things. You're not connected, right? So you've broken the chain of power, Right, we talked about how the top arm rear bends, you've broken the chain of power. If you're popping the hip out, you've broken the chain of power, okay? And then the second and probably most important is that your body weight is on the blade. So the idea is that the weight that are on the feet and the knee are transferred to the paddle when you stroke. So every stroke, 
The goal is to take the weight that's in the boat and move it out of the boat. When you move the hip out on the other side, what's happening is the weight that could potentially be on the blade is now no longer on the blade and is in fact outside of the boat on the other side. And it's almost counterbalancing you, which is great if you're unstable, bad if you're trying to get every, meet, like every meter out of one stroke. So that chicken wing is when the, the, the hand comes to the hip and the hip comes forward to meet the hand. Right? And that's part of a turn. You can keep going. Right? So as I'm thinking about returning my hips forward, I'm thinking of that hip hitting the hand and propelling the hand forward. Um, Henry does this great, and I love his technique on his return because it's so clean, and it's very clear that his hip is what's propelling his hand forward. So sometimes when inexperienced paddlers return, they will think about moving their hip forward, but the moment their hip comes forward, they just exit, right? But what I like to see, what Henry does really well, is as he returns, his hand comes to meet his hip, and his hip propels his hand forward. Keep rotating with your chest up. So chest up, good, now look up, good. <laughs> now you rotate with showing us the back. Check, look, head up, there you go. So, I like that a lot better. Now what happens, go ahead and put your chest down again, and head down, there you go. Do you see how just by putting the chest up and getting the, the, the chin up, go ahead and do that now, we're getting our hips under us, right? And that solves a lot of the back issue, okay? Keep going, right? Not all of it, but I think a lot of the reason why in younger paddlers we don't see them rotate or throw their back across as much is because their hips are far uh, are too far back and so they, they can't really rotate their chest but when we bring our chest up our chin up suddenly we're able to rotate a whole lot more she's reaching through her shoulder to try and maximize rotation unfortunately that's another little little cheat where we think ah free rotation go ahead and take a breath <laughs> so we think free rotation if we just like pull our arm forward we get another like three inches, that's pretty cool. I don't even have to move my hip at all. It's a similar break of the power chain. It's the same thing as like poking your hip out, bending your top arm, pulling through the shoulder or reaching through the shoulder, right? It's those little cheats to try and get us more rotation, but they're only gonna hurt you. I'm looking at our setup. I like her setup, we talked about our setup. But the moment we go from our setup to our catch, what I see move first is the hips go back almost immediately and they don't really follow with the hands. We want to be fully caught by falling on the blade. This is what we say when we say like armpit to knee. Keep your hips under you, chest up, good. Okay, so now we've caught and now we're gonna pull. What happens when a lot of people pull is they pull by just moving their hips back and not connecting with the, the arm. So what that looks like exaggerated is that once I've caught the water, what happens is I pull back my hips and then I pull back the blade. It's when you, we enter the water, you pull your hip back, and then you bring your chest up. And you kind of do this rolling thing where you can fully roll the hip forward. And you, I say rolling because if you looked at my back knee to my top arm, right, what happens is all goes down in like segments. I did this really bad. I was very fluid. And so as I, as I paddled, I just looked like I was doing the worm in the air, okay? But what happens with that is it's, if we're, we're too fluid, then we're not as connected as we could be. Time, I think her biggest things to work on are gonna be first, doing that recovery. So just like Angus, making sure that as we're recovering forward, we're rotating our chest up rather than rotating our chest down, okay? So we're, we're getting our hips under us with that, we're keeping our chest up with that. The second thing is bringing that chin up. What happens when our chin is down or we look down at the boat? is that we rotate and we move our body in the direction of our eyes. So if our eyes are down, guess what? We're paddling down. Eyes are up, now we get to paddle up, okay? And then the third thing I would think about is just connecting that hip and being just a little bit tighter and making sure that we're not worming up and down, but we're keeping a little bit more strict on our A-frame.